Hello, welcome to our author interview today. My name is Morgan Reeves, and I'm here with our visiting author, Peter Brown. Um, he is brought here today through the generous donations um, from Hills Bank and other donors, as well as the ICCSD Foundation. So we thank them so much for making it possible for his visit today. Um, we, he's the author and illustrator of many books. Um, most recently, My Teacher is a Monster, which is checked out. All of our copies are checked out, so we don't have an example for you today. But it's a really funny, funny book. Um, the illustrations are great. He's also illustrated uh, Creepy Carrots, one of my favorite books, written by Aaron Reynolds. And many other books, including another fantastic book, Curious, The Curious Garden, uh, about an urban garden who explores through the train tracks. Um, so school visits haven't started yet. Those start tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to be talking to the kids about tomorrow? Well, uh, thanks for having me here. And when I visit schools, I talk to them. I usually start off by showing them drawings I made when I was a kid, reading the very first book I ever made in my whole life, which I made when I was six years old, okay. which is, yeah, it's terrible. It's a terrible book, but, uh, <laughs> But that's the idea, is the, you know, that was the beginning of my career as an author. So I read my early book and show some of my early drawings, and then I kind of show how I progressed through middle school and high school and college, and then read them my newest book, maybe talk to them a bit about the process of making the new book, whatever the new book happens to be. The new book, in this case, is My Teacher is a Monster. No, I'm not. That's the full title. My Teacher is a Monster. No, I'm not. Um, Actually, the way you're supposed to say it is, my teacher's a monster. No, I'm not. With the voice, yeah. You have to use funny voices yeah. because the kid and the monster are arguing on the cover of the book. So I always encourage people to read that book using funny voices. Anyway, I'm going to read that story, maybe talk a little bit about the process of making the book, do a drawing. I always like drawing for the kids. Kids love drawing. I love drawing. And then take some questions. It always goes over well, yeah. drawing. We just had a, a different author. He had enjoyed drawing all those. Pictures outside. Yeah. So your first book, um, so you started writing when you were six, you said? I, yeah, that's right. So that was your first one, and so from there on you were solid, ready to be an author illustrator? Well, uh, I wouldn't go that far. I loved writing and drawing. I always loved drawing. My love of writing and reading kind of ebbed and flowed as I was a kid. Uh, and for a long time, I thought I wanted to work at an animation studio like Disney. DreamWorks or something like that. Um, An exciting alternative. Yeah, but it was always storytelling with, with pictures and words. And um, it wasn't until I got to college and took some children's book classes that I realized what I really wanted to do was tell my own stories with my own words and my own pictures. And to do that, there's only so many options. Picture books, maybe graphic novels, maybe an independent, independent animation studio. But, um, but picture books felt like the right fit for me. You mentioned graphic novels. I, no I noticed a lot of your books, you include a lot of comics-inspired um, illustrations with the, the boxes and text boxes and uh, the different frames that I think really work well for, for picture books and getting that early visual literacy for some kids. Yeah. The, the funny thing is I, I never really read comic books, and I'm still not into them. I mean, I don't, I've, I've the deepest respect for graphic novels and for comic books, but I'm, it was never one of those, I was never one of those kids who loved those types of books. Um, but we live in a world where you can't escape the influence of comics. I mean, every movie these days is a superhero movie, right? So like we're so familiar with these characters and the kind of universes that are created in these stories. And sometimes the methods they use to tell the stories in the comic book form, like using speech bubbles and different ways of framing the art. Um, so yeah, it kind of works its way into my, my illustrations, even though I'm not a comic book nerd. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> We're not all comic book nerds. Um, so as you were growing up, where, where is it that you grew up? Where is, can, you, can you talk a little bit about your childhood? Sure. Uh, yeah, I grew up um, in New Jersey, an exotic place called New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey actually has some nice parts to it. Um, I grew up near Princeton, 
which most people have heard of because of the university. And around the Princeton area, it's actually pretty beautiful. Lots of rolling farmland, small farms, not like what you've got out here, smaller farms. We, we kind of go in tents. Yeah, you guys are fully committed to the farmland. It's beautiful. We had small farms, forests, um, a lot of history, you know, I grew up where George Washington crossed the Delaware River, uh, famously. Um, so that was, uh, that was my, my childhood, it was spent trudging through the woods and mud and climbing trees and, yeah, outside a lot. And I think it kind of influenced the stories I like to tell. Most of my stories involve nature in some way or another, and um, I'm sure that has to do with my, my childhood out there in the woods. Uh, and in New Jersey, most people don't think of New Jersey as having beautiful places, but it totally does. So say I've, been, I've been to the New Jersey near New York City, and that's just not, not quite as pretty. No, it's getting better, um, but there are a lot of power plants and industrial sites that aren't so beautiful. <laughs> and so as you were growing up, as you got older, where did you go to school? You talked a little bit about that you wanted to become an animator, but what did you have to go uh, major in in school and college for that? Well, I always loved drawing all throughout my entire life and uh, I was lucky that I went to a school in New Jersey um, elementary school middle school and high school that had a great arts programming so I got lots of great art teachers and art education took extracurricular classes um, and then ended up going to a college called Art Center College of Design which is in Pasadena California where I studied illustration for four years um, and that whole time I was in love with characters and story uh, a lot of animal characters, for who knows what reason. Most of my books are about animals. Um, yeah. And uh, so I studied illustration, and I took creative writing classes in college. And, and while I was there, I just I realized that I wanted to make kids' books. So I kind of went all in. By the time I graduated, I had a portfolio that was basically just kids' book illustration work. Most of my classmates were studying different kinds of illustration, maybe entertainment design, like designing monsters for, for Hollywood movies, or, designing, or, or illustration for magazine covers, album covers, that kind of thing. Making kids books was actually, I, was, I felt like kind of a nerd. Really? You know, it was definitely not the cool thing to be studying, but it was the only thing that made sense for me and a few of my classmates. Um, so we, we went in, and, and a lot of us now are doing pretty well in the and kids book Do you world. have any friends from there that you know? Oh yeah, my good buddy Dan Santat is all over the place these days. He makes graphic novels, he makes picture books. He and I went to school together, and um, that guy is a machine. He, he's, I think he has 12 books coming out this year. 12 books. That's that makes me feel. You've been, you've been steadily doing about a book a year since, what, like 2008, 2009? Uh, 2005, I think, is my first book came out. And it's been about one book a year since then, yeah. Which I feel really good about, one book a year. I feel good about, but these guys out there make ten lot. books a year. It's a lot goes into it. Mm -hmm. I've dabbled. I've dabbled. I have to admit that I've dabbled. I did it a little bit, and so I know it more than more work than you could ever imagine yeah. goes into a picture. It book. takes about a year of my life to make each book. Now, it's not a year of solid twenty-four-seven every have day. Table 100 of the time. No, I'm out. Well, so like I'm here visiting schools, and um, that's become a bigger and bigger part of my job. But it takes time away from the creative side of things, you know. Could you talk a little bit about kind of your writing process and your creative illustrating process? Yeah, well, it's always a little different. Every story is kind of its own thing, but usually what happens is I'll have an idea for a story. It might be something like uh, a wild animal comes home with a boy and decides to make the boy her pet. That might be an idea I have for like a little, a little nugget of an idea for a story. And then from there, I'll start figuring out what the wild animal, what the wild animal is. Is it a, is it a rhinoceros? Is it a moose? Is it a bear? Um, and then eventually I'll say, oh, I think it should be a bear. And then I start figuring out what the bear looks like. And then I figure out what the boy looks like. And then I start piecing together the story of like, how does she meet this boy? And uh, what, kind of, what kind of adventure do they have together or whatever? And that, of course, led to my book <clears throat> right there called Children Make Terrible Pets. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's, it's, the title came pretty early in the process because I thought it would be, I don't know, the, when I was a kid, I used to bring little wild animals home sometimes, like uh, turtles or frogs, you know, things I could actually catch. <laughs> and uh, yeah, plus I was afraid of rabies, and I don't know if that's still a thing. But, <laughs> 
but I would bring home like turtles and things. And, and I remember at least once my mom said to me that wild animals make terrible pets because they're not, they're not like dogs or cats. They're not really raised to be pets. They're wild and they need to be in the wild. And so I had that idea of wild animals make terrible pets. And then I just kind of flipped the roles to children make terrible pets. And, and the story, I won't say the story came naturally. All of my stories are really way more difficult than you might think um, to, to like figure out. Um, but the title, having a, having a nice title like that helped a lot. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great like attention grabbing title where your children make terrible pets. Okay. Well, and a good title like that can help you stay focused on what you're really, what the story is that you're trying to tell. Um, sometimes you need a little bit of a guide as you're working through the details of a story. And if, if I'm always trying to reinforce that idea that children make terrible pets, that can help me make creative decisions as I go. Whereas otherwise I might be floundering around, not sure what to do with the story. A good title can actually help a lot. So I notice your illustration style. Uh, I kind of arranged them. Mm -hmm. Did I, I maybe put one in the different creepy carrots to actually be over here, but they're kind of in order here. We've got Flight of the Dodo, and then Chowder, and then Children Make Terrible Pets, and then Creepy Carrots in sort of illustration order. Do you feel like your style has changed a lot over the career? I mean, looking at it, I think so. Yeah, I think there's certain, um, things that are consistent throughout it all. Um, I could get really nerdy and talk to you about them, like my use of composition, my use of negative space, my uh, use of color. I think a lot of those things are fairly consistent. But what I really like to experiment is different media. So my first few books were hand painted in acrylic paint. And then I made a book called The Curious Garden, which was painted in what's called gouache acrylic, uh, which is just a different kind of paint. But it changes things a little bit. It's a slightly different technique. Then I made Children Make Terrible Pets, and um, that was because when I was working on The Curious Garden, I had all these really nice loose pencil sketches that I made while I was planning the book. And I liked the energy that was in those sketches, so I thought, well, maybe there's a way to use, get some of that energy into the finished art. Maybe I can incorporate pencil drawings into the finished illustrations. So I came up with a technique I use there for Children Make Terrible Pets, which involves pencil drawing and cut paper and collaging together, some hand lettering. And that worked really well. So then when I had the opportunity to illustrate Creepy Carrots, I thought, well, maybe I can modify that technique I, I made up for Children Make Terrible Pets. And um, it's not really, Creepy Carrots isn't really collaged together at all. Uh, but you can see the pencil work and, um, and the, the, the palette, obviously, is quite different from. It's very limited. Yeah, from my other books. It's supposed to feel like an episode of The Twilight Zone. Yeah, and I really love how the. Uh the carrots disappear and then, oh, they're, they're just the bath toys. They're yeah, just yeah. Mm -hmm. this innocuous thing here in the background, but it's... Yeah, yeah, it's like a paranoid thriller. Mm -hmm. The Jasper Rabbit thinks he's being followed by his favorite snack, mm -hmm. but then he turns around and it's gone. And then he realizes he really is being followed by his favorite snack. What is he going to do about it? So that was a really fun book to illustrate. And it gave me a chance to do something different with the color palette. I mentioned my color palette being fairly consistent throughout my books, but this is a definite departure. Yeah, you definitely, you, you were pretty colorful in general, it seems yeah. like, so that was an interesting, but you could still tell who illustrated it, which I really like being able to glance at a book and say, ah, this is one that I want to read because I like this illustrator. That's, that's nice to hear. Yeah, I try to, I, I want, I like to experiment, but I also don't want, sometimes people will say that they didn't realize I was the same guy who illustrated the Curious Garden, and I illustrated Creepy Carrots. They might see my newer book, Mr. Tiger Goes Wild, and not realize that I was the same guy who made those other books, you know, because the, the technique, the art does look different. It's a little different, but I can definitely, as, especially in the eyes, I think you can, you look at the eyes and the faces, the way you make faces is pretty consistent throughout. Yeah, I think so. Um, and this one was the Caldecott Honor in uh, yeah, 2013. 2013, so how was that? feeling? Did you get really excited and go out for a big night on the town? Or? <laughs> yeah, actually, I think so, basically, yeah. Um, yeah. I did not know, I had no idea the book was even in contention. Um, so when the phone rang and they told me that Creepy Carrots had won a call to Cod Honor, it was a total surprise. So that was nice, actually. I didn't have to think about it ahead of time and lose sleep over it. Um, but of course, it was a thrill. I mean, the Caldecott is, I've won, I've been fortunate, I've won a lot of awards over my career, but the only one that people are, everybody knows the Caldecott, um, so there's nothing quite like 
getting that nice shiny sticker on, on your front of your book. And we, we do have our, our listings usually of, our, of the winner and, and so, but we always like to put out those honorees as well and, yeah. and really showcase, because sometimes we think that the honoree should have won here at the library. We, we have our own favorites yeah. from the, mm -hmm. each year and sometimes the winners aren't our favorites, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> In a weird way, it's kind of nice that it's not totally predictable. Yeah. Um, I think it might be boring if we always knew which That's book. the winner. I mean, some years, some years it's pretty obvious. You know, the year, uh, the invention of Hugo Cabret won. Although people may not have expected it to win the Caldecott, but the Newberry was this. You, you would think it was going to yeah. win the Newberry, but yeah. But it was definitely award worthy. Everybody knew it was going to win something. And um, but other years, like I think the year that Creepy Carrots won an honor, people weren't really sure what was going to happen, and it was exciting to just you know be part of it. So. Um, I had a question. Uh, this goes back to some of my interests. How do you go to, how do you approach illustrating a book for yourself um, that you're writing and you have control over the story as opposed to illustrating a book with a different author? Well. Is there any difference or is it? Yeah, it's different, very different. I think when I illustrate a book for another author, it's kind of like a vacation because uh, it's pretty, it's not very stressful compared to when I'm writing and illustrating. When I'm writing and illustrating a book by myself, it's pretty stressful because it's just my name going on the front, right? Like, if the book's not good, it's my fault. <laughs> I mean, my editor would probably Thanks disagree. Probably. Yeah, she might have an opinion on that subject, but like, basically, you know, I, I, I have to make sure that I do an amazing job if it's both if I'm both writing and illustrating. Now if I'm illustrating, I totally I still have to do an amazing job, but I only have to do an amazing job at illustrating. I don't have to do an amazing job at writing. So it's a little less stressful. Um, but I kind of prefer doing both actually, even though it's maybe more stressful. It's also more fun because I get to create this world exactly how I see it in my imagination. And I can play with the text however I want to, you know. Um, a lot of times I might have a, a, an early draft of the story will have sentences maybe describing a scene and then I'll do an illustration for that page or whatever and that illustration will completely show what I was describing in that particular sentence so I can then eliminate the sentence because we don't need that sentence anymore. That description is now being shown in the artwork, right? Now that's the kind of decision that happens all the time as I'm writing and illustrating a book. But when I'm only illustrating, it's tougher to make that happen. You can't be like, hey, author, mm. whose book this is not, this is not my book, right. so what if you <laughs> did this? Yeah, friendly advice, little friendly piece of advice. I think this sentence is terrible. No, uh, <laughs> I would probably in that scenario mention to the editor that I had a different idea of how we could handle this page, but it would ultimately be up to them to decide what to do. Um, so I think typically I like doing both because I can just, I can make these decisions on the fly and end up with what I think is probably a slightly more cohesive finished book where the words and the pictures are both equally important. Um, you know, I, I kind of pride myself on making books that make no sense without the artwork, you know? The story itself has to have the artwork for it to make any sense at all. And by the same token, I think without the pictures, without the words, the pictures, the pictures would make more, more sense, but they still need the words to work properly, too. Yeah, I think it's more engaging when you have to like read the words and then study the art and then turn the page and then read the words and look at the art, really to understand what's happening. And so that's what I strive for and what I think is a little more easy to achieve when I'm both writing and illustrating. A lot of kids, you know, generally they like to know lots of really cool things about their authors, so do you have any hobbies that you do, uh, you know, in your busy, busy schedule with running around? Do you have time for any fun hobbies for yourself? Well, uh, let's see. Sort of. I really, I like cooking. So I cook, I mean, everybody needs to eat food. I f yeah, but I like, I actually like cooking. Like, I enjoy the process of cooking. So I cook maybe more than the average person, perhaps. I don't know. I, I just like cooking. I do that, and I, um, the fact is I really love my job. I mean, my job is both my hobby and my profession. You know, it's fun. I've never, I feel like I, it's work, but it's fun work. And so I kind of work a lot. Yeah, it's pretty great getting paid to do your favorite thing in the world. So, and I do. So I work a lot. Um, there's not a whole lot of time for extra stuff. But 
Uh, I thought maybe you were a gardener, the Curious Garden being yeah, such a... I know. It would make sense after the Curious Garden that I would be a gardener. But it's hard being a gardener in New York, first of all. I have plants in my windowsills, but I don't think that counts as actually being a gardener. It's, yeah, yeah. And even those plants don't last for... I'm not very good. They don't stay alive that long. I've had to buy really um, durable plants. Those I can keep around. Well, that's important. Yeah. Weather. Weather is bad sometimes. Well, yeah, and it's, I travel a lot, so I'll leave these plants alone for a couple of weeks at a time. And, you know, so they have to be like cacti. I've got some cacti. Mm hmm. Yeah, they've got to be tough plants. So, do you have a next book that you're working on? I know your newest one just came out recently, but have you already started your next project? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so My Teacher is a Monster, No, I'm Not, came out in July. And so I've been traveling a lot for that book and doing things for that book. But when I'm not out there doing events and visiting schools, I'm working on my first middle grade novel. For the first time in 10 years, I'm not working on a picture book. Whoa. I know. This is big news. Stop the press. Uh, but I've had this idea ever since I made The Curious Garden, actually. That was when I in dreamed up this idea for a story, the one that I'm now working on. Um, and I can talk about it a little bit. My publisher, w and it was announced in Publishers Weekly. Give out some top details, I can give out some of the details because they, 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 they talked about it quite a bit in PW. But uh, it's called The Wild Robot. And it's about a robot who's um, stranded on a remote island in the wilderness all by itself. And all it really wants to do is stay alive and stay functional. But it doesn't know how. And so what it does is it studies the animals on the island to see how they manage to survive. Because it's, you know, it's a robot. It looks kind of tough. And it's looking at these little birds and mice and tiny little animals manage to survive. Yeah, these fragile little things. If they can survive, surely the robot can find a way. So it studies all these different animals, various techniques for survival, and learns from them. And over the course of the story, begins acting more and more like animals, like the different animals that it sees. And so it starts off the story like kind of a, like a familiar kind of robot character. And by the end of the story, it's, it's acting like an animal. It's talking. It's making animal sounds. It learns how to communicate with the animals. And it's basically a robotic animal. It sort of has gone through this tran massive transformation over the course of the story, to the point where it doesn't want to leave the island. It feels most at home. I will stay here, please. Thank you. Basically, yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of a fun thought experiment about how technology and humanity interact with nature. It's a lot of uh, sort of big themes, um, which are not uncommon to my books. I mean, books like Mr. Tiger Goes Wild and Children Make Terrible Pets and The Curious Garden are all kind of hitting on this idea of our relationship with nature um, and wildness and wilderness. And I think the, the wild robot is sort of the, the logical conclusion of that entire chapter of my career, because it's like the most, it's the most extreme example of interaction between sort of civilization and, and the wild, so. Well, it sounds like an interesting one. I'm going to write it down, and we'll make sure we get that one. Make sure you read it. You're going to really, you're going to want to read it. It's, it's going to be, it's going to change everything. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I'm joking. It won't change everything. But it'll change something. It'll change a couple of things. If you can change just one kid, that's always good, right? I'll start. That sounds good to me. Do you have a favorite author? Aside from yourself. <laughs> I'm, I'm nowhere near <laughs> my favorite author. Um, probably Jules Verne. Jules Verne? Yeah. Jules Verne's probably my favorite author because he sort of invented science fiction. And I love science fiction thus my upcoming book. Um, but I don't know if you've read any Jules Verne, but his books are like this really cool combination of science fiction, but it's really kind of believable. You know, he writes things in a way where it's, you think that could actually maybe happen, you know? However, he was writing in a time when it was totally futuristic. We look at his work now and submarines exist. So, you know, 20,000 leagues under the sea, doesn't seem so crazy anymore, but when it, yeah, but when it, when he wrote it, of course, submarines weren't even a thought. So 
so I have a lot of respect and admiration for his writing technique, um, the subjects he writes about, and the way he brings what could be cumbersome subjects. He really brings them to life and makes them exciting, I think, for the average reader. So yeah, Jules Verne, number one. I like that your science fiction. Science fiction is my favorite, so oh, yeah. I like that. Cool. Are you reading anything right now? I'm always reading, all the time. I read for an hour every morning. Maybe not when I'm in Iowa, but when I'm home in New York City, waking up in my own home. Part of the daily schedule. My first, the first hour of my day is coffee and reading. So I'm, all, I've, I'm reading all the time. Right now I'm reading um, Welcome to the Monkey House, which is a collection of Kurt Vonnegut short stories. And I'm a big Vonnegut fan. If you like science fiction, you've probably read a few of his books. Yeah. I just read Cat's Cradle last week, and I had read it before, but that's a really funny, wacky, weird science fiction story. Uh, so I'm reading Welcome to the Monkey House. I'm reading Nine Stories, which is a collection of short stories by J.D. Salinger. Um, so I don't know why I'm reading so many short stories right now, but that's just, there's no real reason for that. It's just sort of. Short stories are good. I mean, maybe if you don't have enough time in your busy schedule, you can at least get one story in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, as I work on my middle grade novel, I'm interested in seeing a lot of different people's writing techniques, you know? So rather than reading an entire Vonnegut novel or an entire Salinger novel or an entire whoever novel, you know, I can, I can kind of zoom in and out, read a few short stories, get a sense of how they do things, and then see if maybe I can learn something from them to sort of apply to my own work, you know? All right. Well, thank you, Peter Brown, for coming and visiting us here at the library we appreciate it and again thank you to the hills bank and the iccsd foundation and other donors for making this interview possible bye <laughs>